last week, we, we, um, we had a conversation about Juneteenth. And this week, I'm going to try to perch on this stool. Pray for me with these heels and this dress. <laughs> Here we go. Amen. I bless Tito's name, who found a safety pin for me. Amen. And um, we are going to continue our conversation. Last week, we talked about Juneteenth. And I think one of the things that is so um, wonderful about our partnership is that between the two of us, we represent a, a great deal of identities. And we were able to use that um, last week. And we talked about Juneteenth and lift every voice and sing and about how sometimes that song in particular can feel proprietary to the African-American community. But I think the common themes and the thing that we're gonna be talking about today is we share, um, our communities share uh, a thing about language. Hmm. Language is always changing. Language is so important. It's been used to define, but it's also been used to oppress. And so today we're gonna to be talking about language, we're gonna be talking about allyship, we're gonna be talking about pride. And I'm gonna start off with um, my own little personal story of what I thought was allyship. And let's remember that like racism, homophobia is a spectrum. You move along it, you take others along with you, you, you learn more, you do better. And so I thought that I was the best ally ever. And I had a friend, um, I was in a writer's group at the public theater. And I had a friend who was trans and I did not know. And I told, and I was in this writer's group and my friend was writing his experience of being transgender. And I kept not hearing what he was saying. I kept thinking he was writing a fictional piece and I was confused. And so finally I said to him one day, you know, I, I must not be hearing your play right. <laughs> you keep talking about your play and the main character is a transgender man and I keep thinking you're saying that that's you. <laughs> Silly me, I keep confusing you with this character. And finally, he said, Bridget, I've said it over and over again. This play is about me and I am trans. And I still was like, I hear what you're saying, but I keep hearing that you're saying that that's you, but you're actually talking about your character. He was like, no, Bridget, I am trans. And so because he was able to pass, I had no, I was not thinking um, appropriately or, or, or anything. And I told this story over and over again, thinking how cute it was that I didn't know that my friend was trans. Look at me, I thought, how, how ignorant, but how beautiful that I didn't know that my friend was transgender. That's not a beautiful story. That's not allyship. That's not my story to tell. That's, I don't have to out someone to make myself look like a better ally. I told that story as recently as two or three years ago. I recognize now that the story that I should have been telling is my own, my own ignorance and how I mistake someone passing for acceptance. There's all sorts of layers to that story. And one of them is my own lack of allyship, and my own ignorance, and my own desire to see trans where I think I need to see it, or how I think it should be presented. And so allyship, I've learned, is not something I confer on myself. It mm -hmm. isn't. I can't declare it. Allyship, advocacy, words matter. Yeah. So. They do. They do. And I think that, you know, what we talked about last week and how we're talking about today, and even how we're talking about pride, that this is an evolution, right? Like over the past 
five years, 10 years, how the pride flag has changed so dramatically and continues to, continues to evolve um, this day. How the pride flag responds to Black Lives Matter, how it responds to brown people and people without documentation status. How the pride flag now deals, I mean, it's always been a rainbow, which implies it's not about a binary, but now it specifically deals with bisexual and transgender folks in ways that it didn't before. It's an evolution. It's the language and it's the representation, but it is our stories that we tell and how we rehearse them with each other that help us tell a better story. And so, Bridget, thank you for that vulnerability. I think it's really beautiful how, how the scales fell from your eyes and how you were able to move forward with that. I also think, well, I think a lot of things, but you're in charge. So. I'm in charge? Yeah. Amen. So I also want to say a little bit, too, about some of the terminology, because I think that we use language as an excuse and as a crutch to not do better. Oh, the language is always changing, or I can't keep up, or why does it have to be this instead of this? Again, we don't get to define, straight people I'm talking to, we don't get to define how people in the LGBTQ what they call themselves, how they define themselves, that's not for us to decide. Language is always, is ever evolving. So we know that homophobia is a dislike or prejudice against gay people. Transphobia is a dislike or prejudice against transgender people. Cisgender describes a person whose gender identity corresponds to their sex assigned at birth. Transgender describes a person whose gender identity does not correspond to the sex that they were assigned at birth. Now, there are many, many other terms that we could go into, but I wanted to lift those because I feel like those terms are, are, are places that people get stuck at, right? And I want us to at least be able to have a clear understanding and a clear definition of what those terms mean. I'm going to take us to scripture and a story um, in two ways here. First, a story. I was in high school when Will and Grace came out. You all remember Will and Grace, right? Mm -hmm. So watch from Hulu. I was in Annapolis, Maryland, and desperately wanted to live in New York. He was a gay kid. Of course I wanted to live in New York. Like, and there was this guy who had my name. He was this guy, Will, who <laughs> lived on the Upper West Side, which was exactly where I wanted to live. And he was gay. And he had this great friend, Grace. And I had a great friend named Karen. And I had many great girlfriends over the time. Karen is actually the one woman now that uh, I got to take to my senior prom. And, um, and our parents were like, oh, that's like a will and grace, like right here at home. And it was this thing where it's like, okay, so Will Truman, like let's talk about words that matter. His last name is True Man. Like that's specific. That's some crafty, shady writing there on the parts of the writers. That is saying this guy is a real man. That was a political act in 1995. There was also his sidekick, you may remember Jack McFarland, played by an actor who is now out, but could not be out then as a gay man. And Jack was what we called back then flaming. And Jack was everything you didn't want to be. You wanted to be the true man. You wanted to be the gay guy, but you, you, yeah, like you wanted to look like the Abercrombie and Fitch catalog. You wanted to be a lawyer on the Upper West Side. You were gonna have kids. Marriage was all the thing. It was, I'm just like everybody else, except I'm gay. That's what we did. That's what I did. I can't tell you how I have spent the last 20 years trying to go beyond that limited identity that was available in 1997. The identity that our children have now, how they can talk about gender expression, how they can talk about non-binaries, non-conforming, gender expansiveness. God, I wish I had that language when I was a kid. I so wish I had that language as a kid. I also wish I was strong enough or convicted enough to say, I don't have this language, but I know that it's me. I wasn't. I was trying to fit in. Scripture. 
tells us in the beautiful words that John read this morning from the beginning of Genesis, that scriptural account of the sixth day of creation. God created humankind in God's own image. Male and female, God created them. We all know what this means, right? Like we know this is a white bearded God sitting up in the clouds, creating Adam and Eve, male and female, he created them and that's that. It's not what scripture says, friends. That's the story that we've told ourselves. Genesis 2, which tells us the story of God, of Adam saying, I am lonely, and God saying, oh, okay, take a nap. I'm going to extract a rib, much like he does with Cher, and build you a new friend out of this other rib. And here's Eve. Two versions of the creation account. They don't match. This is fine. This happens all throughout the Torah. The two book, there are two different accounts of most of the first five books of the Bible, and how we order them puts them back to back with each other. For centuries, theologians have accounted for this Genesis conundrum. Genesis 1 says God created male and female. Together, they were created equal at the same moment. Genesis 2 says, no, Adam was created first, and woman came out of Adam's side. Theologians and the church history have said Genesis 2 is an expansion of what happened on that sixth day. That on the sixth day, God created Adam, maybe first thing in the morning, and by afternoon, Adam was bored, and God said, okay, great, here's Eve. Let's think about this a little bit more. Male and female, God created them in God's own image. That tells us that God is not male only. That tells us that God is female, because male and female are created in God's image. So the white-bearded God doesn't work simply right there. Mm -hmm. Then we get a little bit farther into the language, and if you really get to the language, it is not men and women God created them. He creates attributes, male and female. These are characteristics of people, not definitions of people themselves. What I read in this scripture now, what I think is true, what our trans, what our bisexual, what our bi non-binary folks are telling us is that each of us have the male and the female attributes in each of us. All of us, all of us. I am a male-bodied person, but I have many wonderful aspects of the feminine, of the female, that I am taking my lifetime to make friends with. Because when I was a kid, I got beat up for them. So I have spent years learning how to suppress all of the God-created feminine in me in order to fit into this male body. God says, male and female, I created you. And when Adam gets lonely, God pulls some of the feminine, not all of the feminine, some of the feminine, God pulls out with that rib, and no doubt at least some of the masculine as well, trailed along with it, because creation is messy stuff. And there's another person. Two different bodied people, both with attributes of what we call masculine and feminine, all of us, have this opportunity now to live into that day of creation where God, in neither male nor female body, but with attributes of male and female characteristics, creates humankind in God's image. This, I think, is so important for where we are linguistically and the great pronoun struggle that so many of us are having. Like, what are our pronouns? What are your pronouns? Do I need to identify them? Arguments on both sides. Should I list them? Should I not list them? Is it insulting if I have to tell you my pronouns? Does it assume that, I would, that you wouldn't know my pronouns if I have to tell you? God created them. That's what scripture says. Scripture doesn't say God created man and women. Scripture says God created them. Scripture gives us them as the original pronoun for us. We've gotten it muddied primarily because men have been in charge for too long. Amen. And there it is. But male and female, we are all created, and here we are. This morning, you've noticed the choir and Bridget, everybody, I said, it's pride, it's hot. The air conditioner, we don't know what's going on with it, but we'll get to it. It's hot, robes are warm. I said, come in pride, like come with pride. Also. Jesus doesn't require robes to worship God, so we're, we're, we're okay, um, still like this. Um, but this posed a great dilemma in my wardrobe choices this morning. Um, 
And, um, and, and this morning I was, you know, I have this nice boot which adds a couple inches to my right side of my body. And I uh, suggested this morning that I would counter it with this pair of uh, really sparkly glitter hot pink heels that I have. Um, and so I walked into the bedroom with uh, the boot on one foot and this hot pink stiletto on the other. And my husband, who is no stranger to color, um, said, no. <laughs> No, West End is not ready for that yet. Um, you may wear a sneaker, but you may not wear that. So, um, so there are elements that we are all living into. And Bridget, your point about language and also the point about the flag is that all of this is an evolution. But it's an evolution that began way back on the sixth day of creation, when God had something to say. And what God said was, my God, that is good, is what God said. God said it is good to be gender non-conforming, to not live in a binary. God said, male and female, I created each of you. That is good. And that pink heel, that stiletto, is on its way. <laughs> that is what I pray for West End, that we get to the point where you don't have to question that. I remember when you got married, and um, we had a little bit of a celebration here. And we were celebrating you. And I was like, where's the, the spoon so I could click the, the glass for a kiss? And Will was like, um, we're, we're not doing that. And I was like, come on. West End is ready for a kiss? I don't know. Maybe they weren't then. Maybe they are now. It's an evolution. It's an evolution, right? And I think that the story, the, the connections that you just made are, are liberating. Um, one of the things that I have been corrected on over the years is I think I said something about, oh, um, this thing that we're doing in church is about um, LGBTQ pride. And, and my friend Guthrie, who you know, Guthrie said, no, this is about uh, liberation. That is what we're talking about, liberation. Yeah. Um, because within these communities, um, the oppression has been especially traumatizing because it has used spiritual language. Um, so much harm has been done. And so as we continue to move along the spectrum, I'm hoping that we can reclaim language the way that you just did. Yeah. You know what I think will help us, Bridget, is our young people. I think this is our children, and we have to listen to them really carefully. Mm -hmm. The anthem we're going to hear this morning, last week we talked a little bit about Lift Every Voice and Sing, and then Cassandra led us in a really beautiful version of it. The anthem that we're going to hear today comes to us, um, Malcolm suggested it actually to Henry, and comes from, the lyrics are written by middle schoolers in a middle school in Maryland, in Ellicott City, Maryland. The lyrics are beautiful, but what's more beautiful is that it's actually the voices of children. What our young people are telling us we need to listen to. Entering more conversations with curiosity, creating more space for voices that don't sound like ours, and letting them, in the words of the great Whitney Houston, lead us well. Let them lead us and take us on. And I think they can. I'm not going to sing, I believe the children are my future, but I could sing, I believe the children are the future. Um, and it's pride and I have a right to sing the children are our future, but, um, but the choir is going to sing instead. But um, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there is something that we can look to and all learn from together. So my last sort of point and my question to you was what can we do to be better allies? Yeah. What does the community need from you know, us? I think it's a great question because Homophobia and racism, like, I know that none of us think that we're racist, and I know that none of us think that we're homophobic. And what Bridget and I can tell you in different ways is the countless microaggressions that we all cause um, in both of these ways. So being attentive to language is really, is really important for us. Um, I'm your first gay senior minister. I'm your first queer senior minister. That's a distinction of language that I could talk about on another day. But what, and, and for the record, the church hasn't fallen down yet because of that, um, which, is, which is no small feat. <laughs> but how we ask little things, 
like questions like, is, that a, is he a family person? Or, well, is he going to get married? Or, does she always wear pants? Or, I don't understand or know what to call him. Or, that's not the name I knew him as. These are all things that we can get better at. And we have to, and so what allyship looks like is being able to say to a friend in love, I can answer that question, but let me first tell you how that question feels to me. And this is what Bridget and I try to do. Um, I think we do it successfully sometimes. Sometimes it's messy, but we get through it, which is, which is what is really great. And I think that's what we can all do. And if we've done anything these past um, two weeks, these two dialogue sermons, trying to talk about allyship, trying to talk about the complicated history of Juneteenth and of racism, and today, the complicated history of LGBT pride. This started as a riot. It is largely now a corporate parade. It is not a parade, it is a march. It is a march. It is a march for liberation. If you hear anybody, that's one thing you can all do today. Anybody that says you're going to the pride parade, I am not going to the pride march, begins your response. It is a march because people died for this fight. It is a march because this is not about a float by Citibank or JetBlue, although I'm glad that they're there and I happily take their money. <laughs> but this is about liberation. And you're right on that, Bridget. Absolutely. Amen. Amen.